let's go to the word of God in Judges chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. Or, yeah, 17 through 19. Okay, let's read together. It says, however, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. And there was, for there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord. Turn aside. Do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. Then she said to her, then he said to her, please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. But she, so she opened a jug of milk and gave him to drink and covered him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. I'm gonna say, before you sit down, I'm gonna say, Jael. You're going to say your time has come. Hallelujah. Jael. Your time has come. Jael. Jael. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise and you may be seated. Since the beginning of the year, we have been talking about the kingdom. Or better yet, since last year, we have been talking about the kingdom. But this year, we focus on the role of families in the kingdom. Why? Because God is a king, but he has the heart of a father. God has a kingdom, but he leads the kingdom as a family. So we need to know how the heavenly family functions how a spiritual family functions, and how biological families function. And that will allow us to get a better grasp of the kingdom of God. So in the context of family, we've talked about the role of fathers. We spent two months talking about the role of fathers. And this month, uh, we've role of fathers or men in the kingdom. We spent two months talking about the role of men in the kingdom. Uh, particularly fathers. And this month, we're talking about the role of women in the kingdom, particularly mothers. So it is that interest that led us to the story of Deborah um, three weeks ago and the story of Jael starting last week. We began talking about her. One of the things that I had mentioned at the beginning of my teaching last week is that God has prepared a season of glory for each and every one of us. I know that because the Lord says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. So God has a plan for everybody to shine in one area or more in their lives. So there is a season of glory. There is a season of grace. There is a season of a prosperity. And it doesn't necessarily mean money because prosperity means advancing for each and every one of us. And we have here a woman called Jael. She was able to mark her time. She was able to mark her day. She was an ordinary woman. She wasn't a judge, a prophetess, or queen. She was just a housewife, the wife of Heber. But she so marked her time that in an entire era of biblical story carries her name. The Bible speaks about the days of Jael. She marked history even though she was an ordinary woman. And what I feel that God has given me as a prophetic word for women, this is the time where he's going to take ordinary 
women and he's going to transform them into extraordinary leaders. Hallelujah. So it's the time that God is going to transform ordinary women like Jael into extraordinary leaders that will mark their time and their generations. And many will call them blessed afterwards because they were a tool, an instrument in the hand of the, of the, of the Almighty God to accomplish his purposes. So, uh, Jael, but one of the things that I had said last week also is that success is preparation plus opportunity. Success is preparation plus opportunity. It doesn't matter how many opportunities can come your way. If you are not prepared to take advantage of them, they will amount to nothing in your life because you weren't prepared. So Jael, God is going to give her a couple of minutes of opportunity. She's going to have a window of opportunity at a very specific moment in history. And she's going to take it. She's going to mark her time because she was prepared for it. Now, before I talk about that opportunity, last next week we will talk about that. But we are studying the life of Jael. We're studying the character of Jael to see the traits that she had, the attributes that she had, the characteristics that she had that prepared her for the right moment. Again, success is preparation plus opportunity. Most people think that success happens overnight, but it's not true. You develop yourself, your character, your skills for many years in the dark before they actually show up in the light. So Jael had seven characteristics that made her an extraordinary woman. And in due time, the extraordinary person whom she was manifested. But she had developed these traits before. So last week I had looked at two of them with you. And this morning we're going to look at another two. The first thing that I had said last week. How many of you remember what we said about Jael? She was what? A hard. Jael was a hard working woman. There's a reason why the text said it was, he came to the tent of Jael. In that time, it was the responsibility of women um, to build tents, install tents, and maintain tents. So she was a hard working woman. If it were today, we would have said that she was working in construction. So it takes a hard working woman to work in construction. So Jael was a hard working woman. Number two, we saw last week that she was a loyal woman. She had a husband by the name of Heber, whom we're going to talk a little bit more in detail. When Heber decided to betray God and the children of Israel, she remained loyal. Even though her husband decided to betray, but she remained loyal. Uh... Jael was living in a difficult situation. She was handling a very, very, very difficult case. She was married, as we said, to a man named Heber. And Heber, spiritually, was moving backwards. Heber was, um, Heber was from the tribe of the Kenites. And the Kenites were descendants of Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. As a result, Heber was connected to the children of Israel, both by faith and by marriage. They were connected to Israel by faith because Jethro was a priest. So Jethro had a relationship with God. So he had the same faith with Israel. He also was connected with Israel because Jethro was the father-in-law of Moses. So Moses was married to Jethro's daughter. So he was connected 
um, to the Israelites both by faith and by marriage. And this tribe called the Kenites, they were nomads. Nomads, which means a tribe that does not have a land. So the Kenites didn't have any land. But the children of Judah took the Kenites in their midst. So they lived among the children of Judah. And Heber had a place among the children of Judah. But we're going to see four strategic mistakes that Heber is going to make. And Jael had to take her position when, uh, when Heber started making those mistakes. The first mistake that Heber made is that Heber, along with the other Kenites, he was living in the tribe of Judah. So the children of Judah had given him land. The first thing that we read in the text, the Bible says in the text that Heber had separated him, himself, from the other Kenites who were living in, among the who were living in the tribe of Judah. So the first mistake that he made was that he left the tribe of Judah. The second mistake that he made is that when he left the tribe of Judah, he went and found a place uh, uh, near the border of Israel and Canaan called Kedesh. So second mistake, he was living at the border, one foot in Israel. And one foot in Canaan. So that man was living in two worlds. That was the second mistake. The third mistake that he made is that he made a covenant. He made an alliance with the Canaanites. Because the Bible says there was peace between the house of Heber and Jabin. In that time, in order for two groups of people to live together, they had to make a treaty of peace. So when it says there was peace among them, it means that they had made a covenant. Just like Isaac had made a covenant with Abimelech to live in peace. That man made a covenant with the Canaanites to be in peace. So the third mistake is that he made a covenant. He made an alliance with the Canaanites. So that was the third mistake. First, he left the tribe of Judah. Secondly, he installed himself at the border. Third, he made a um, covenant with the Canaanites. Fourth, he chose to turn his back on Israel and betray the people of Israel and the God of Israel. Because the Bible says when Deborah gave a prophetic word to Barak and said, attack Sisera, the person who went to tell Sisera that Barak was training 10,000 men and was about to attack him was Heber along with the other Kenites. So he betrayed Israel and he betrayed the God of Israel. So he made four strategic mistakes. And those were those four strategic mistakes that made Heber a backslider. So I told you that Heber represents the backslider in the Bible. And today, that same trajectory, trajectory, every person who's backsliding in the Christian life go through exactly the same trajectory. Number one, the first thing that they do when somebody's moving backwards and they're becoming a backslider, the first thing that they do is that they abandon Judah. What does Judah mean? Judah in the Bible means praise. Judah means praise. In other words, that um, it means that Heber left the place of praise. He left the place of worship. He left the place of intimacy with God. He left the place of prayer. So when somebody's backsliding, the first place where the person becomes a backslider, the first place where the person become cold is their devotion life, their life of intimacy with God. You don't backslide by leaving the church first or by not showing up on Sunday morning or by not showing up in worship services. The first place where you begin to backslide 
is in your personal life of intimacy. During the coronavirus, a lot of people came to the Lord. But I've also seen a lot of people backslide. During the coronavirus, there's been a tremendous cleaning in the body of Christ. It happened in Tabernacle of Glory, and it happened with every church, almost every pastor that I know. The same phenomenon that happened at Ta Tabernacle of Glory also happened in their churches, whether American church, Spanish churches, Haitian churches, French, all pastors are telling me the same thing. In Africa, in Canada, in Europe, everywhere, they're telling the same thing. Oh, during the corona, I mean, some of, you may, some of you may experience what I said here. Some of you have been to Tabernacle of Glory before coronavirus. If you look around, you, you will realize that you don't know half of the people in the church. So there's a good amount of people who came in. And there's a lot of people you used to see. Talk to me. There's a lot of people who used to see their seats either are empty or occupied by someone else. People who used to see, you don't see them, and you see a bunch of new faces coming. During the coronavirus, God shook. God shook the church. God shook the kingdom. God shook the body. And everybody who was not stable, everybody who was living a life of Hebrew, one foot in and one foot out, they found an opportunity to leave and they say I'll worship at Bethel I'll stay home but in reality they're not even connected by television oh I realized during the coronavirus God shook the church only the strongest remained. Only the strongest remained in their faith. Remain. And, and, and so many people fell by the wayside. They say, I'm going to stay home and watch the service because I'm afraid of coronavirus. But they're going to work on Monday. They're going to work on Tuesday. They're going to work on Wednesday. They're going to work on Thursday. They're going to work on Friday. On Saturday, they go out and spend. On Sunday, they are scared of coronavirus because they are living in between two worlds. They just needed an excuse to stay home. If I understand well, they didn't feel comfortable in the worship anymore. They didn't feel comfortable in the prayers anymore. They didn't feel comfortable with the word anymore. They just needed an excuse. So that was the life of a Hebrew. So Hebrew went and changed and made covenant. And anyway, let me, try to, let me try to move forward real quick. And Heber ended up betraying the children of Israel. You, do you know the harshest critics of the church? The harshest critics of the church are not unbelievers. Follow me. The harshest critics of the church are often backsliders. Unbelievers are unbelievers. They've never been in church. They've never sung in the choir. They've never been an usher. They, never, they, don't, they don't care about church and they don't know about church. It's not their world. Usually the harshest critics that you have are not, are, are, are not unbelievers. It's, it's usually the Hebrews who benefited from ah, uh, who benefited from prayer, who benefited from the grace, who benefited, benefited by being in the tribe of Judah. Now they are in between two worlds and they finally made announce a now alliance with the Canaanites now they're gonna turn their back and try to destroy the body of Christ so Heber was a nomad he didn't have any land but Israel received him with his family and now not only he left the tribe of Judah, he went to the border, he made a covenant with the Canaanites, the oppressors of Israel, and now, he, he, you, and now he's plotting with the enemy to destroy Israel when he had benefited. Now that was the kind of husband that Jael had. So she was living in a complicated 
situation. So when Heber decided to betray the children of Israel and the God of Israel, Jael didn't agree. Jael remained, remained loyal to her people and her God, and she didn't agree. However, even though she didn't agree, she didn't say anything. Why didn't she say anything? She didn't say anything, not because she was scared, but because she was strategic. So that leads me to the third characteristic of Jael. Jael was strategic. When Heber decided to ally himself, align himself with the Canaanites, align himself with Sisera, align himself with Jabin, she didn't agree with it. She didn't like it. She didn't say anything. Why didn't she say anything? Because the Lord didn't say for her to say anything. She didn't do anything because the Lord didn't say for her to do anything. Are you guys with me? In other words, in other words, Jael was a woman who was strategic. She didn't move by emotions. She moved by, di by divine direction. Oh, you didn't hear. I'm going to say it again. Jael was a strategic woman. She didn't move. She didn't move by emotion. She moved by divine direction. Somebody say divine direction. So as a result, even though, even though Heber had betrayed, she didn't say anything because the Lord didn't tell her to say anything at that point. There is a time to talk and there is a time to be quiet. There is a time to act and there is a time to immobilize yourself and wait for the deliverance of the Lord. She didn't do anything. She didn't say anything because the time to do anything had not come yet. She didn't say anything because the time to talk had not come yet. She's going to talk later and she's going to act later. But at that moment, she stayed quiet because she didn't get a direction from the Lord. Are you guys with me? If you're going to be a Jael, one of the things that you're going to need to cultivate is the art of silence. You're going to learn to develop the art of saying nothing. You don't have to talk all the time. You don't have to react all the time. You don't have to give your opinion all the time. You don't have to give a piece of your mind all the time. Sometimes you just need to learn to be quiet. Somebody say quiet. Well, Jael, you must learn to be quiet because I read somewhere in my Bible, in the multitude of words, sin abounds. You must learn to be quiet because my Bible says, he who guards his lips shall save his soul from much trouble. Say quiet. You got to learn to be quiet because my Bible says even the fool is counted as wise when he manages to keep his mouth shut. Say quiet. You must learn to be quiet because the Bible says in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Somebody shout quiet. You must learn to be quiet because when you are quiet, you give the Lord an opportunity to fight for you. Because I read somewhere hey, that the Lord will fight for you and you will hold your peace. Somebody say quiet. Sometimes the best weapon of war is silence. Sometimes the best weapon of war is quietness. Sometimes the best weapon of war is saying nothing. Again, say quiet. If you're going to be a Jael, you can't talk all the time. You cannot talk all the time. You got to learn to wait for divine direction and talk at the right time and talk at the right moment. Say again, quiet. Now I want you to understand that Jael was quiet, but she wasn't mute. You didn't hear what I said. Uh, she was quiet, but she wasn't mute. She was tranquil, but she wasn't 
tongue-tied. She was speechless, peaceful, but she wasn't speechless. Ah, in due time, she spoke. In due time, she spoke. She wasn't, she was quiet, but she wasn't mute. If you're quiet, you're not talking. If you're mute, you can't talk. Jael knew how to talk. She just wasn't talking at that time because the Lord didn't say talk. Say quiet. There are two verses in the Bible that appear to be contradictory. There are two verses in the Bible that appear to be contradictory. In Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5, we find two verses that seem to contradict each other. Let's read together. The verse 5 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. And the verse 5 says, answer a fool according to his folly lest he be wise in his own eye one verse says do not answer a fool and the next verse says answers the fool so which one is it is the bible contradicting itself know that the bible is not contradicting itself what the bible is says there is a time to answer a fool and there is the time not to answer a fool and you gotta know when to make the difference ah oh, somebody shout glory so Jael didn't answer anything at that time because she has the wisdom in order to know when to answer the fool and not to answer the fool. It requires you to have the intelligence of God. It requires you to have the wisdom of God to know now I should talk or now I should keep my mouth shut and I declare in the name of Jesus Christ the wisdom of Jael, the understanding of Jael is going to rest over your life in the name of Jesus Christ. And shall and he shall glory. Yes, Jael wasn't quiet. Jael wasn't just mute. Jael was strategic, 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 strategic. The word strategic in English, it comes from the word strategos in Greek. You know what it means? It means general. It means an army general. When you are an army general, they call you a strategos in the New Testament. It means you're a general, a strategic person thinks like a military commander. Oh, a strategic person thinks like a military commander. And a military commander does not go to battle by emotions. They don't conduct a military campaign based on feelings. Now, some of you may be young to remember 9-11. How many of you remember 9-11? Some of you can still remember 9-11. When 9-11 happened, uh, immediately the same day 9-11 happened, they identified the enemy. They said the only terrorist group capable of delivering such an attack, orchestrating such an attack, is El is Al Qaeda, and Osama bin Laden is the person who is responsible. The very same day, the adversary was identified. But I was expecting the United States to go to war the next day or the next week. But I don't know if some of you remember the United. States States waited for almost two years before they attacked. Why? Because you can go to war on feelings. You can go to war on emotion. They can't hit you today and you're going to war. You have to sit down and plan. You got to sit down and strategize. You got to sit down and position. And when the United States went to war, they were there for 17 years. Are you guys with me? Because, yeah, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, Proverbs 20, verse 18, by what? wise counsel wage war the bible says by wise counsel wage war if you're gonna go to war you better have some wisdom you can't go to war like a crazy person you can't go to war running your mouth like a fool you can't go to war you know taking out your shoes and and throwing off your shoes and and picking up glasses and and breaking the chairs and break nah! no the bible says by wise council go to war before you go to war you got to get up to the council of heaven you got to stand before the throne of God and say Lord I'm about to go to war 
I need supernatural wisdom. I need supernatural understanding. I need supernatural perception. I need supernatural solution so I can win my war. Somebody shout glory. If you're going to be a jail, you got to quit acting on emotions and begin to move by divine revelation. You don't go to war based on emotions. You go to war based on revelations. And I declare in the name of Jesus Christ that God is going to give you wisdom. He's going to give you understanding. He's going to give you strategy for the war that you're waging. And I declare that you are more than conqueror. I declare that you are more than conqueror. I declare in the name of Jesus Christ, you will not fight like a fool. You will not fight like a fool. You will not fight like a fool. You will fight like a general. You will fight with the wisdom of God. You will fight with the understanding of God. You will fight with the revelation of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, somebody shout amen. The cause may be right. Your heart may be right. Your motivation may be right. Your intentions may be right. But if you wage war the wrong way, you can lose the battle. You can wreck your marriage. You can wreck your ministry. You can damage your future. Not because your heart not because your heart was not right, but because there was no wisdom in fighting the battle. Oh, Jael knew she was fighting a battle in her own home. She was fighting a battle in her own home. She was fighting a battle under her tent because Hebrew and Sisera had become one. Sisera is a representative of the kingdom of hell and her husband had made alliance with him. She needs to win the war without losing her marriage. She must crush Sisera's head without breaking her family. She needs wisdom. So she didn't talk. When the Lord didn't tell her to talk, she didn't talk. She was strategic. That's why she was a great woman. She was a strategic. He's a second characteristic. Let me, let, me, let me move on. Not only Jael was strategic. She knew when to talk, when not to talk, when to act, when not to act. She waited for revelation at the right timing. The second thing that Jael has, she was hospitable. Somebody say hospitable. Oh, wow. She was hospitable. She was warm. She, she, she was sociable. She knew how to receive people. She was generous. The Bible says, Sisera, the oppressor of God's people, in the heat of the battle, secretly descended his chariot, got off his chariot, and ran. And he ran where? To the house of Heber to the tent of Jael. But why the tent of Jael? Because Jael was the wife of Heber and he had a covenant with Heber. So he already thought in himself, if I'm going to be safe somewhere, it's going to be in that tent because Heber is a backslider. Even though I, I am an unbeliever, but he's a backslider and we are in the same boat, living the same life, Drinking beer together, spending Saturday night at the club and the casinos together. Heba is my man, so I'm going to go to my man's tent. <laughs> but he made a big mistake. Because that day, Heba was not there. <laughs> so this man was running towards the tent. And look at what the Bible says. This man was running towards the tent. 
And the Bible says, when Jael saw Sisera coming, <laughs> the oppressor of God's people, the oppressor of Israel, the one who's actually robbing the Israelites' house, the one who's raping young women, the one who's oppressing Israel for, for, for 30 years, when he saw Sisera coming, Jael went out of her tent to meet Sisera. And look at what she said to him. She said to him, turn aside, my Lord. Turn aside. Do not fear. Look at how she addressed him. She addressed him as my Lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, 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 wow. She addressed him as my Lord. In other words, sis, Jael was hospitable. Jael knew how to receive her guests with honor, respect, and dignity. She received him with the highest honor. <laughs> let me phrase this. Let me say, let me say it like this. Jael was a strong woman. We had said that. She used to work in construction. But she knew how to receive her guests. In other words, to be a strong woman, you don't have to be disrespectful. <laughs> oh, I'm going to say it again. To be a strong woman, you don't have to be disrespectful disrespectful doesn't make you a strong woman it just makes you disrespectful it just makes you ill-mannered you can still be nice you can still be courteous you still you can still be approachable and affectionate and still be strong because the greatest strength that exists, the greatest strength that exists is called gentleness. The greatest strength in the universe is called gentleness. How do we know that? Because that was the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am what? Gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your soul. Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. Jesus was gentle, but he was not weak. Gentleness is not weakness. Some people confuse gentleness with weakness. They think if, you are, if they are gentle and courteous, it means that they are weak. It's not true. Let me, let me explain the word gentle to you. In the Bible, the word used for gentleness, the Greek word used for gentle, it describes a horse. It describes a horse that has been tamed a horse that has been domesticated are you guys with me the word gentle when you take a horse and you tame the horse and you domesticate the horse they said that horse now has become gentle it's no longer savage it becomes gentle. Now, when a horse becomes gentle, does it lose its strength? Does it lose its power? Does it lose its horsepower? A horse that becomes gentle does not lose its power. It doesn't lose its strength. But what it means is that when the just become gentle, it means now the strength is mastered. The 
power is mastered. The power is controlled. The power is channeled to a positive force. Oh, a savage horse kicks people all over the place, has no control of itself. But when you take that horse and you tame the horse, now all of that power can be directed towards a direction. And that horse runs faster. That horse performs faster. That horse becomes more effective because the power is controlled. When you are gentle, it means your strength is under the control of the Holy Ghost. Somebody shout glory. Gentleness is not weakness. Gentleness is strength under control. Gentleness is not weakness. It is strength under control. And guess what? That strength that is called gentleness. Women have that strength naturally. Men have to work to become gentle. But women have the, the, the strength that is called gentleness. A woman has it naturally. And we should not undermine that. Because we are living in a generation that undermine gentleness. They tell you, in order for a woman to be strong, in order for a woman to be strong, they tell you that, you know, you got to talk like a man. You got to see if you can add some bass to your voice. You got to walk like a man. You got to shake hands. You don't have to talk like a man and walk like a man and shake like, like a man to be strong. You can still be gentle and be strong. You can still be respectful and be strong. You can still be courteous and be strong. You can still be hospitable and be strong if you understand what I said shout glory Jael and by, and by the way by the way what brute strength cannot do you will be amazed to see how quickly and easily that gentleness does it <laughs> Jael was a, she was a strong woman, but a gentle woman, a hospitable woman, an affectionate woman who knew how to talk to people, who knew how to be respectful, who knew how to be courteous, and who knew how to be dignified. And she, 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 she received him well. And as a result, what Barak with an army of 10,000 men could not do on the battlefield, She's going to do it in the tent. Oh, are you guys with me? But how did she get him in? With gentleness. So she said, but he's, let's look at the hospitality. I'm about, I'm, about, I'm about to close there. Not only that, as a hospitable woman, not only she knew how to talk to people, but she also had something that was powerful. She had a servant's heart. She knew how to serve. Look at what, when, when Sisera came in, look at what Sisera said. Sisera said, please give me a little water. He didn't even ask for a cup of water. He didn't even ask for a glass of water. He said, I am thirsty. Please just give me a little bit of water. But Jael, the Bible says, you said, <laughs> you want a little bit of water? She said, I'm going to do better than that. You want water? I'm going to give you milk. So she said, give me a, he said, give me a little bit of water. The Bible said she opened a jug of milk. <laughs> he asked for water, a little water, but she opened a jug of milk. And the Bible says in the next chapter, not only she opened a jug of milk, she went for her most beautiful bowl. The Bible says he asked for water and she gave him milk and she brought out cream in a lordly bowl. Lordly bowl means the most beautiful bowl, the most expensive bowl. He asked for water, but not only that, she asked for water, but he, she gave him milk. But she didn't just give him milk. She gave him milk with the cream and she put it in her most beautiful bowl. In other words, she served him with excellence. Oh, 
Lord, you didn't hear what I said. I said she served him with excellence. But you got to remember, you got to remember that Jael was a woman who worked in construction. So she had a, a outside job. She was a professional tent maker. But if you realize, Jael was excellent outside. And she was excellent inside. She was excellent in her workplace. And she was excellent at home. She was excellent in the office. And she was excellent in the kitchen. Ladies, it's not one or the other. It's both. It's both. It's both. It's not, it's not, it's not either I'm a good woman at home or I'm a good woman at work. If you're going to be a jail, you gotta have both covered. All of your bases gotta be covered. Ah, if you can't say amen, say how. She served him with excellence. In other words, if I'm understanding well, Jael, if you needed her to write a good letter, she could write a good letter with no grammatical mistake. But if you took her to the kitchen, uh, she would give you some good macaroni and cheese. And, uh, and, and I don't know, I, I don't know. I don't know if you eat Haitian food, she'll give you some good tasso cabrit and she will give you some good banana. And she wasn't just excellent in her workplace. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna say Jael, say a Raj, Jael. 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 She was good both at the office and the kitchen. She was good both in both, in both places, in both places. So you got to have your bases covered because you got to understand there are some Ciceras that you have in your life. There are some demonic oppressions that you have in your life. If you're going to break them, you're going to need to be both good in both environment, in both environment. Maybe you have a Cicera who declares you'd never get married and you'll never have a family and you'll never have children and you'll never have a life at home. Home. And I'm going to tell you, in order to break, crush the, the head of that Sisera, you're going to need to be good in both places, in both places, in both places, in both places. I know that you want to get married, but can you boil an egg? Oh, no, I'm not going to get into your business. I'm not going to get into your business, but I'm saying, I'm saying, can you, can, can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard, I've heard a lot of young women say, I don't know, you know, I don't know, you know, I, I went to college and I finished school and I'm a nurse, I have a good job, but I can't find a man. You see, when you say that I'm a nurse, I can't find a man, it's like somebody say, you know, you know I'm a lawyer, I don't know why I, why I can't play for the NBA. It makes no sense. Because the skill you need to argue a case in court is not the same skill that you need in the basketball court. It's a totally different skill. The skill that you need as a nurse is different from the skill that you need as a wife. Can I talk to you? Can I talk? Can I talk to you? Running a house is a skill. Ah, maintaining a marriage is a skill. Making a home is a skill. Working the home is a skill. Somebody shout glory. And I'm not the one who said it, because I know some of you are saying, you know, Pastor Greg, you know, you know, old-fashioned pastor, you know, old-fashioned pastor. But it's not me, it's the word of God, unless you want to say the word of God is old-fashioned. Look at Titus chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It says, by doing this, by doing this, they will teach somebody say teach somebody say teach by this they will teach the younger women to love their husband and their children oh my goodness I, leave that verse there I won't have time to talk to you about that the Bible says they will teach them to love their husband and their children in other words the love that draws you into marriage is not the love that keeps you in that marriage The love that draws you into marriage 
is not the same love that keeps you. The love that draws you is the emotion and the appearance and all of that, etc. But the love that keeps you in marriage is a different love and you must learn it. And that's the mystery about marriage that people don't understand. And they say, I have fallen out of love. You've fallen out of love because the love you were supposed to develop, you never developed it because you never learned it. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do you learn those, that, that, that love? Either you had your own parents who had that love and demonstrated in front of you, or you have somebody else who tells you, baby, that's how you take care of a man. That's how you take care of a woman. If you never learn that love, you'll never have it because the love that keeps you in marriage, that allows you to keep a husband or a wife, you must learn it. But look at what it says. By this, they will teach the younger women to love their husband and their children. Verse 5. They will teach them to be wise and pure and take care of their homes you must be taught how to take care of your home just because you went to college you went to miami dade and fiu and you came out with a bachelor's and you came with a master's degree from um it doesn't mean that you know how to take care of a home See, you 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 see, that's why so many marriages are falling apart. You have a lot of women these days, they know how to take care of a patient, but they don't know how to take care of a man. Uh, oh my goodness, I, no, let me just leave. why you need spiritual mothers in the church spiritual mothers who will call you by the kitchen and say I'm gonna teach you what they didn't teach you at FIU I'm gonna teach you what they didn't teach you at UN I'm gonna teach you what they did teach you at NYU Oh, I'm done preaching. Let's start praying. I'm done preaching. I'm done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm done preaching. I'm done preaching. Let's just stay. Let's just stay. I'm done. I'm done. Marakata Bashakataya. Yes. Somebody shout yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah, yeah. Say yeah, yeah. Say yeah, yeah, yeah. Jael knew, she knew how to take care of a man. Even though she was a strong woman, she knew how to treat a man with respect. She knew how to receive a man with honor. She knew how to take care of her home. She knew how to serve very well. She was hospitable. Now it was, now how did she develop that? She developed that by serving her husband, Heber. Even though Heber was a compromised Christian, she still served him well. Even though Heber was not doing well spiritually, but she made sure that she still took care of him well. So she practiced being a good wife on her own husband so when Sisera walked into her tent the same thing that she naturally does for her husband she receives Sisera with that same respect she receives Sisera with that same honor she receives Sisera with that same excellence and Sisera became so at ease Sisera became so vulnerable that after eating in the middle of a war 
and he knew people was after him to kill him but she received him so well that he decided to go to bed he started sleeping under the tent and he started snoring like a bear and it was while he was profoundly sleeping that Jael was gonna teach him the lesson of his life he'll never forget it in life and in eternity what lesson next week we'll see it next week we'll see it but today we just want to pray to be strategic women we can no longer kingdom women are not crazy women kingdom women are not empty-headed women kingdom women are smart women kingdom women are wise women kingdom women are strategic women kingdom women talk when god says talk kingdom women act when god says act somebody shall let's stand on our feet we need some wisdom in this place we need some wisdom in this place Jael, with her gentleness and hospitality, was able to do what Barak, with 10,000 soldiers and a sword, could not do. But she did it with hospitality. She did it with kindness and gentleness. Creating me a clean heart and purify me, purify me. Create in me a clean heart so that I may work. Sing it as a prayer. Create in me a clean heart and purify me. Purify me. Create in me a clean heart so that I May worship cast me now, cast me now. Please don't take, Please don't take your spirit from me and restore and restore. Cast me now, cast me now. Please don't take. Restore and restore so that I may work. Say, create in me, create in me, sure. and purify, purify, create. revelation right now stop praying for wisdom father in the name of jesus we pray for wisdom and revelation in this place so that i so that i may stop praying i'm gonna give you a minute right now to pray for wisdom and revelation you need the wisdom of jail you need the wisdom of child. You've made too many mistakes. You've made too many mistakes by talking in the wrong time, by saying the wrong words, by making the wrong decision, by moving 
in the wrong direction. You need the wisdom of Jael in your life to learn to be quiet when God hasn't said anything. To learn to immobilize yourself when God didn't say go. To learn to stop when God didn't say move. Pray for the wisdom of Jael. Pray for the wisdom of Jael. Pray for the revelation of Jael. Pray for the strategy of Jael. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray that you lift up mighty Jael in this generation. I pray that you lift up mighty Jael in this time. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray for the grace of hospitality. In the name of Jesus Christ, let us be a generation that knows how to talk to people. Let us be a generation that knows how to serve people. Let us be a generation that knows how to receive people. Let us be a generation that knows how to honor people. Do it, Father God, in our lives. Manifest your glory and manifest your presence in the name of the Lord. Gasmina, Gasmina. Please don't take. And restore, and restore the so that I so that, that I may We're going to sing that song one more time. But maybe you're in this place and you say, Pastor Greg, I am a Heber. I am a Heber. I left my place of intimacy with God. And I ended up being at the border of the world and the faith. And I ended up you know, making alliances with the wrong kinds of people, the wrong kinds of friends around me, but I want to come back home. Maybe you've even turned your back on God and you say, I want to come back home. So wherever you are in this place, we're going to sing that song one more time. If you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time or you simply want to come back home, I'm singing that song just for you. Just for you, my brother, where you are. You are a Heber and you say, I want to come back home. I want to come to my place of intimacy with God. I want to come back to my place of communion with God. I want to be in the house. I no longer want to be outside. I no, wanna, no longer want to be straddling the fence. So wherever you are, we're going to sing that one more time. Wherever you are, in all of our campuses, wherever you are, come down. Come forward in all of our campuses. Come forward. Let's sing it. Cast me not away from that present. Hallelujah. If you want to give Jesus your life for the first time, my brother, my sister, my brother, my sister, you want to come back home, wherever you are, just come. Just come as you are. He will forgive you. He will embrace you. He will love you. He will restore you. Please don't take your spirit from me and restore the joy of salvation. There are a number of people who need to still come forward. Another young woman needs to come forward. Another young woman needs to come forward. Another young man needs to come forward. As we sing that song, wherever you are, in all of our campuses, come, come, come. And restore and Cast me not, cast me not He will embrace you He will love you He will transform you He will make your life bring you He will forgive you He will give you a clean slice Create, create Create clean heart and purify, purify me, create in me. Say, create in me. Wherever you are, keep coming forward. Keep coming forward. Keep coming forward. Say, God, change my life, transform my life. I refuse to live a life of Heber. I refuse to straddle the fence. I refuse to live between two worlds. And purify me. Purify. Create. Let the chains break now. Let the chains break now. Let the fetters break now. Let the chains break now. 
Let the chains break now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let destruction be broken in the name of Jesus and restore. So that I, with your hands lifted up, I'm giving you one more chance wherever you are, wherever you are, young man, young woman, wherever you are, young man, young woman, and say, Lord, I refuse to live in between two worlds. I'm totally yours. I refuse to be a Hebrew. I'm totally yours. Please don't take and restore the joy of salvation. So that I so that I so that I Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a round of applause for everyone who's come forward wherever they are in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching that video. If it was a blessing to you, click the red button that says subscribe. Click now. Now.